hello. Welcome back, class, uh, to Intro to Philosophy, 1301. Today we're doing chapter, what is it, 13? Chapter 13, yes, Hegel and Marx. Unfortunately, in your textbook, it's a pretty small chapter. And these are two of the most important uh, philosophers uh, that have actually made an impact on the world. Uh, to give you an example of this, um, Karl, Marx, Karl Marx once said, uh, or wrote, in his uh, thesis on Feuerbach, that the role of the philosopher thus far has been to interpret the world, but it should be to change the world. So for him, philosophy is not just about theory and interpreting the world, but actually trying to uh, change the world as well. Okay. Um, and I'm saying it's very really, uh, ironic that your textbook doesn't pay too much attention to these two philosophers because they have changed the world in many, many uh, different ways and are still around us today, um, especially when it comes to uh, world politics. So before I go into any uh, more details into that, um, I want to talk about first about Hegel. Because basically, in order to understand Marx, you must understand the philosophy and the framework of Hegel. <clears throat> basically, Marx was uh, adopted Hegel's philosophy uh, to his own, I guess, time period, his own preoccupation or praxis. So I'll write that down, praxis. This is basically the marriage, uh, marrying or uh, consolidating theory and practice. So again, this is all that Marx was all about, this practice. But let's go first with Hegel. Um, and I guess before we go to the actual philosopher, I guess it's, it's important to, to uh, take note uh, what time period we're on. So we're in the 19th century, so this is the 1800s all the way to 1900. And <clears throat> this is a, a time of a lot of uh, social and political upheaval. And that's very, very true. Uh, the Industrial Revolution is, is happening, it's going full blast, literally full blast. Um, all these scientific discoveries and inventions that happened in the 16th and 17th century. Um, in the 18th centuries are now really giving us an idea of like progress. So a lot of scholars call this era uh, the age of progress, this, this century here, 1800 uh, to 1900. Or more and more precisely, this age of progress was seen from the 1800s all the way to 1914, exactly. Um, anyway, know what's happening is in 1914, it's the outbreak of World War I and that completely shatters any uh, idea that we're making progress with this te technology and science, right? We just, as a matter of fact, we realize that we're using this to kill each other. And how can we call that progress? So this, this age of progress is from this 19th century, uh, 1800 to 1914. Uh, you have a very, very important scholars in this era, such as like uh, Johann Kierkegaard, um, who actually questioned the assumptions of Hegel, uh, and we'll talk about him in the next chapter. Uh, we also have Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche in this era. Um, you have uh, Schelling, Spearman uh, philosophers, you have Holderlin coming up, and then of course we have Hegel. And Hegel is the, of all, all these philosophers in this century, including I guess Marx even, <clears throat> there were, uh, he was like the most famous one. Definitely, he was like the, the hottest uh, trend, and at least for sure in the German areas, in the continent of Germany, he was like the, the best philosopher around. So everybody was a Hegelian. So let's go talk about Hegel himself. I got some notes here. 
So Hegel, uh, I think he was born in Stuttgart. He was born in Stuttgart, Germany. This is in southern Germany, uh, close to the Rhineland area. You know about that stuff. Um, by the age of 18, father I guess, like um, through grade school, he actually won a scholarship to go to the university, the University of uh, Tübingen. Um, there he studied theology. That was the thing that he studied, not really, not really philosophy, but theology encompassed what we call philosophy now as well, though. Um, Holderlin, I mentioned this, his full name is Johann Christian Friedrich Holderlin. He's perhaps known as the, the greatest German romantic. He's a poet. Um, he was a roommate of Hegel during this time period here. Um, Oh no, he was, a, he was like his best friend. The roommate is this other guy, Schelling. Uh, Friedrich Wilhelm Joseph Schelling. Schelling is, is uh, uh, another philosopher. He's not a poet like Holderman, he's an actual philosopher. Um, and he's famous for the idea of natura philosophy, or natural philosophy, or the philosophy of nature. Um, he, not only that, but he pretty much dabbled in all these other crazy other things, aesthetics metaphysics. Um, he was not really famous at all. Um, actually, um, there were good friends, Hegel and Schelling, they were roommates during this university, University of Tübingen, uh, right? They shared the same dorm, basically. And they were really good friends until Hegel published this one book excuse me, called The Phenomenology of Spirit. It's upside down. Is the way it looks. Pretty, pretty important book here. Um, and totally critiqued Chelling's, uh, I guess, very abstract notions. Uh, Schelling was not as empirical as Hegel. Okay, so we know this distinction is now about rationalist and empirical. And it seemed to uh, to Hegel that Schelling was not even, not even rationalist, he was just abstract. Um, and lo and behold, Shelley now holds a really important place in, in philosophy. Uh, a lot of contemporary and more modern philosophers came to appreciate Shelley way after his death <clears throat> and realized his important contributions, especially his ideas of being and becoming, which was also the same ideas that Hegel was uh, formulating. So they had like a competition going on. So they after he published, Hegel published Phenomenology of Spirit. It's a big word there. Uh, and critiqued Schelling. They, be, they, became, they became enemies. Their friendship ended, basically. Uh, long story short, what's going on here, the significance of all of this, it's that there's just like this milieu of this intellectual rigor at these universities in Germany at this time period. And they've been inspired or influenced by uh, events around the world uh, during this time period in this 19th century you you not only do you have the emerging of industrial capitalism in cities in, in english cities such as manchester and liverpool which is also has its ties to like the burgeoning of slavery over here in the plantations in the americas it's all connected it's this whole globalized economy is going on here that's beginning to pop up which gave rise to what we have now as our economy but this is the birth of not just like the age of progress, but the birth of capitalism is in this time period here. Capitalism as we know it now. So there's all this, you know, there's a lot going on in the world, a lot of changing. Uh, there's the Napoleon is invading Germany. As a matter of fact, the day that he finished this book, the story goes, is that Napoleon invaded um, Tübingen, where these guys were uh, studying. So there's a lot of like turmoil and upheaval, right? a lot, a lot of stuff changing. But there's this uh, promise or hope that technology and science is the way to progress, the way towards harmony, a better future. Until World War II, World War One, 1914. All right, so I'm just friends with these guys. Um, after graduating from the university in 1793. Right, so this is, we're not even in the 1800s yet, right? So 1793, um, 
he spent uh, a couple of years, like most, um, I guess, philosophers during this time period, as a private tutor to wealthy families. So we have a very, very much wealthy and a bunch of workers. So he was able to be a tutor, private tutor, and live a relatively, you know, scrape out a good living, you know, that he was okay. Um, and although he was really, he was raised as a strong Catholic, I mean, not a Catholic, not a strong Protestant Christian, uh, when he got out of the University of Tübingen, or Tübingen University, he totally kind of went all kind of backwards, kind of like started to critique, or not critique, but not take Christianity um, at face value, right? So again, he got a doctorate in theology. So now he was, uh, now he was slowly becoming a philosopher. So he was never first a philosopher. This guy was first a theologian, and then later in life started to, to deal with more philosophical issues. And this is a time period where he kind of like let go of believing in the word of Christ and the word of the Bible and go on his own kind of explorations intellectually. Um, for example, one of his early essays um, compares Jesus with Socrates. All right, so we have this comparison with Socrates and Jesus that he's making there. Uh, and back then, this was rather controversial. Um, in 1799, um, his father dies, and he gets a large sum of money, an inheritance, and he's able to uh, quit uh, private tutoring, and he decides to join his friend um, Shelley, they were still friends at this time, I guess, at the University of Jena. Um, there, he was working as a, what we call a Privatdozant in German, and that's just pretty much like a, a lecturer, kind of like me, but it doesn't get paid. He's just doing it for the experience and for hopefully later on to get, you know, uh, a job. Um, I guess the same kind of system is still here, right? I'm an adjunct professor. I'm not an associate professor, right? I'm still kind of like part-time. And I do get paid less than the full-timers, which is, I mean, that's the way it is, right? It's just capitalism, it's competition. What we'll to get into right now with Marx. So anyways, while well, Jenna, Hegel wrote his first great work, this book here, uh, that was in 1807. And then this is when the friendship with his friend Shelley ended. And they became kind of bitter enemies after that. <clears throat> so anyway, see, after a while, you just got random jobs as an editor for this newspaper for a while. He became a principal for a high school as well for a while. There he wrote The Science of Logic, another important book of his. Um, and then finally in 1816, he lands a job as a chair of philosophy at the University of Hildeberg. Mm, it's all in Germany. And there he finally writes his big magnus opus, the Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences and Outline. Um, and then a couple of years later, he gets a better job at the University of Berlin. Now he's really, really well known. Perhaps the most famous, uh, or no, he is the most famous philosopher now um, in Germany. And then in 1831, he dies of cholera. Mm, so this is pretty much his, his life story. So let's now let's get into his actual philosophy. And why is this guy important? Why do we care about Hegel? So to begin with, he was firstly uh, greatly influenced by this other German philosopher that we just talked about, Immanuel Kant. Um, and he, in Hegel, um, was super amazed how Kant was able to synthesize, right, uh, these seemingly two different ways of approaching epistemology, which is the the rationalist and the empiricist way of looking at things, of knowledge. He was able, Kant was able to synthesize, synthesize these two views into a one kind of system of philosophy, the synthetic a priori statement, or a priori synthetic statements, whatever. So Kant separated, but in doing this synthesis though, what Kant did was that he separated this world, the noumo world, the world of the things in itself that we have no access to, than the phenomenal world. This is from the last lecture. Just kind of we 
rehashing stuff here. So he made a dis big distinction, Kant did. And Hegel believed that he could uh, synthesize that distinction, or really need that distinction at all, while still maintaining both rationalism and empiricism together. Okay? So that's like, kind of like the, the inspiration that Hegel has for his philosophy. And another thing that I should mention about Hegel is that he is known as the last systematic philosopher. What this means is that he like systematically questioned, like all not all, but I guess all yes, options in philosophy at that time period. So he wrote a book on on uh, metaphysics. He wrote a book on ethics and aesthetics. He wrote a book on logic. He wrote a book on on everything. Right. He systematically questioned every single aspect of philosophy. Pretty much after Hegel, uh, most philosophers kind of specialize in one field or two. Right, but not on everything. So Hegel is like the last systematic philosopher. Uh, think about kind of like Aristotle, right? Did the same thing as well. <clears throat> well, anyways, um, so Hegel uh, sought to go a step further from Kant, and um, and find this complete synthesis, a complete synthesis that would draw these two different epistemologies together. Rationalism and empiricism, with no need for two different worlds and stuff. Mm, and this is what he says. This is like a kind of like a little formula that Hegel has here to uh, to illustrate this point. What is real is rational. What is rational is real. And so this consciousness itself, right, being rational, that is what is real. Right? It's not two separate things out there. It's just you know synthesis. Right. So what is real is rational, what is rational is real. So the metaphysical reality, the real, is what he calls idea or mind. Or the or also the spirit, right? The phenomenology of spirit. And what is this thing? What is this spirit or mind or idea? <clears throat> so um a way to uh we find this is by calling it the universal of universals. Uh, there's like this, think about it like this way. There's like a whole bunch of minds, right? Everybody here, every single human being has a mind. And according to, I mean, according to Hegel, there's like, there's that, and then there's like this bigger universal mind. That we all share with, with it. We partake in that universal mind. So there's like individual particular minds and then the universal mind. Uh, this absolute idealism. That's what that's the goal of the system here, of this philosophy. So it kind of goes like this. Uh, what what Hegel is doing is that he's claiming that our history is this procession towards this spirit towards this universal mind, towards this idea in capital I. And the way we do it is by becoming more self-conscious and having and realizing more knowledge. So becoming more rational and becoming more aware of not just myself, but by doing that, becoming more aware of another person. And, and it goes on and on and on until we reach this, everybody's on the same page, basically. It's universal mind. And that's the idea of Hegel, right? This is the way that history kind of unfolds from Hegel. <clears throat> so Hegel's view is kind of like this panentheism, right? Whereas pantheism is uh, the belief that God, or this big universal mind, or idea, whatever you want to call it, um, is everywhere in the world. That's pantheism. Panentheism is like this Hegelian view here, that God, or the mind, this universal mind, or idea, is everything in the world, but it's also more than that. Okay. And our goal is to get there. And he claims that history is getting us there. It's kind of inevitable. It's just that's the way the history kind of marches towards towards this universal mind. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> So for Hegel, 
um, he sees he sees history of the whole world as the continual development of spirit towards this greater self consciousness and self knowledge. So towards this greater self consciousness and rationality. <clears throat> The final stage of this is what we call total self-consciousness. This is the absolute idealism. And this is the name that we gave him to his, to his system of philosophy here. And how do we get there? How, how's the, what's the steps we need to do? And he explains it by the, the concept of the dialectic. Right, the concept of the dialectic is really a, a triad. It's, like, it's, it's three things. It's three processes. That can do forever and ever and ever and first until we get to the absolute idealism, until we get to the universal mind, the universal thought or idea, whatever you want to call it. So the dialectic is is this the three things. It begins with the starting point, this original starting point, which we call now the thesis. And then this thesis gives rise, or the way that the thesis, this original starting point, identifies itself has this self-relaxation, this self-cognizance. It's by its antithesis, antithesis, its opposite. <clears throat> and then according, and then finally, we have this, this, this stage here where these two things synthesize. It's called synthesis. And this is this begins a new thesis, and it goes forever and ever and then like that again and again and again and again. That's the way it goes. That's the the trajectory of history, according to Hegel. <clears throat> and the way he kind of explains it um, in one of the chapters in this book here. Um, it's a discussion of what he calls the master-servant relation. And it's, it's fascinating the way, the, the insight that he gives us here in this, in this idea. <clears throat> so Hegel begins by pointing out, um, and I'm just going to read this from this, these uh, notes that I have here, that only by acknowledging a self-consciousness, oh wait, by all, sorry, Hegel begins by pointing out that only by acknowledging an other is self-consciousness possible. Right, so we need to acknowledge another to know myself. This is what he's saying here. <clears throat> but if there is an other, then the original self-consciousness feels threatened and asserts its freedom by trying to dominate that other and force acknowledgement of its dominance. The ensuing struggle results in a master who dominates and a servant who is dominated. The master then forces a servant to produce material goods for the enjoyment of the master. But at this point, the master now depends upon the servant he has dominated. In the first place, his self-consciousness as master is subject to his recognition as master by the servant. But more important, while the master has been consuming or destroying what the servant makes, the servant has been learning to create, to bend nature to his will, and so has established his own self-consciousness in relation to what he has created. Furthermore, the labor of the servant has a permanent quality, whereas the master's consumption, again, depends on the servant's production. So by dominating the servant, the master is dominated. Damn, right? But it's fucking powerful, right? That even when you try to dominate that other, so first of all, to find subconsciousness of myself, I need to find, right, like a mirror, basically, something, some other, another person, to find that I am me, and that is him or her, or they. And then when I do that, I feel threatened by that other. I say, oh my God, there's this other. I, mean, I should dominate it. Right? It's like, a, according to Hegel, that's our, 
instinctual nature sort of dominated. But then I dominate this other, he becomes my servant, and I depend now on the servant for my existence. So there's like this mutual symbiotic relationship going on between the servant and the master. That's, I, don't know, I find that very, very powerful. And so did Karl Marx. So that's the idea of this dialectic. And this is basically where your book ends. It's just kind of terrible, right? So this is, I'm gonna go on here. So the solution is to, con to this contradiction, right, between the servant dominating the master is to acknowledge that neither master or servant is free and that freedom is not possible in relationships of domination. So the next stage in the dialectic is for the mind to seek freedom within itself. So that's, that's Hegel here. This idea of dialectic, the absolute idealism of this march towards history. <clears throat> so, um, let's, see. let's move on to uh, Karl Marx now. Stretch a little bit. This it's a lot of stuff. There's really stuff here. Let's go over. And unfortunately, the book does a really bad job. So I'm gonna have all these have all these books around here. Trying to help me out. I'm trying to teach you all. Some really good books. Basically, look, I have Marx, Capital Volume One, pretty thick. And he had Volume Two, a little bit less thick. And then Volume Three, you know, super thick. So yeah, this is his his masterpiece, Capital, his Capital for Marx. Let's talk about Karl Marx now. And yes, I read almost all of this one, not the other ones. So, so Karl Marx, let's see, I think that this other source is a little bit more precise. So we talked about Karl Marx, about this, him realizing that the role of the philosopher is not just to interpret right, and understand the world, but we need to go beyond that and change the world. And this guy, uh, the reason why he feels this way is because he, he, he grew up right smack in the middle of the emergence of industrial capitalism, uh, unfettered capitalism, where there was no regulations back then. It was child labor. There was uh, long, long working hours. Basically, you worked according to what the machine stipulated. It was filthy. It was dangerous. It was poor wages. It was a really bad situation, right? So he wanted to change that. And to a large extent, he did. Not during his lifetime, but you know, the reason why we have uh, eight-hour days plus, and then overtime is because of Marx's theories. Uh, the reason why we no longer have child labor is also because of some of Marx's theories. And stuff. The reason why we have uh, Medicare and Medicaid and stuff like that, it's also part of Marx's theories. So he did influence the world but unfortunately not during his lifetime. So anyway, let's talk about his uh, background a little bit, just like I did with Hegel, and then I'll go into his philosophy. And I guess to go in the spirit of Karl Marx, I'm gonna take a little sip of this beer here. It's really thirsty. I don't know if it's the beer itself or something else, because Karl Marx, that was his favorite hobby. He liked to drink. He liked to get in fights. He was just a rowdy little guy. He was just, he loved life when he was a young kid. And there's actually a really good movie. Um, if you guys happen to have Amazon Prime video, like an irony of that, because Karl Marx would have hated Amazon, and Jeff Bezos, anything. Anyways, if you happen to have Amazon Prime video, um, there's a good movie called The Young Karl Marx. And it also it explains all these theories really, really well, perhaps better than me, because it's a really interesting movie. It's a foreign film. They hardly speak English, but um, that adds to the authenticity 
and it's very actually very very authentic like they they stick to the history really really well i was really impressed by that by the movie that it quickly became one of my favorite movies just on the basis on how accurate it is um the director is raul peck you know, you guys there's a film buff out there so anyways um car marks um Born in 1818 uh, to a very heavy Jewish pedigree. Uh, his grandfather, great grandfather, and great great grandfather were all rabbis and stuff. Um, uh, his father stopped that. His father was a lawyer, but in order to save his job, as a, and he was like a government lawyer in the government, he had to turn to Christianity. So he renounced Jewish, his Karl Marx's father, renounced Judaism, and then raised little Marx as a, as a Christian. <clears throat> so he was born uh, the third of nine children. There's a lot of children in his household. Uh, Heinrich and Henrietta Marx uh, in the town of Trier, Germany, also in the Rhineland. Um, in 1835, um, Karl Marx went, goes to the University of Bonn to study law, kind of to follow in his father's footsteps. Uh, and again, he was not the model student, or probably would have hated to have him as a student. Uh, he spent too much time drinking, <laughs> uh, writing love letters, uh, <laughs> uh, and not focusing on his studies at all, basically. He was just having a really good time out there. Um, at the insistence of his father, because he knew he was, the kid was going nowhere, Marx is transferred to the University of Berlin. Right? This is where Hegel, uh, Lass was at. And there he completely changed. So he got, became focused. And may, maybe because it was, he was so, so awestruck by the Hegelian system of thought. Right? It, that was the rave, anyways. Everybody was doing that. Everybody was doing Hegel. Right? And that was like the cool thing to do. Right? So there was this, this group of, of young scholars, right, students at the University of Berlin called the Young Hegelians. And Karl Marx was one of those people. And they were just kind of troublemakers, but they were university students, right? Nothing new, right? We still do that, right? <clears throat> so he begins to focus now, right? But there he abandons his legal training and starts, starts to focus on philosophy. Although he never himself called him, he never called himself a philosopher ever. But he began to just study philosophy and then economics. Those are the main two things he just fell, fell in love with to the um, chagrin <laughs> of his dad. The dad was not happy about that. Um, anyways, he, um, he wrote a dissertation, a PhD, um, contrasting Democritus and Epicurus. You guys know who these are, I hope. Uh, and was accepted uh, at the University of Jena, also a Hegelian institution. And in 1841, he finally received his degree. So back then, you had to write a dissertation and then send it to different universities, and maybe one will accept it, and then you'll get your degree. And it's a different system of universities over there in Germany than over here. <clears throat> but um, at the University of Berlin in Jena, he became very radicalized. He became very involved in politics. Thus, he was never able to get a job as a professor because he was very controversial. Um, pretty much it, it, uh, his leftist politics, right, his radical politics just made it impossible for him to, to get a job. Right? He just kind of got a bad rap. So in 1842, um, a year after he graduated, got his, uh, got his PhD, uh, he took a position as an editor uh, at this uh, newspaper, this liberal middle class newspaper, the uh, Rheinisch Sultan. The Rhenish Gazette. Uh, this is a newspaper in Cologne, uh, Germany. He was uh, a little bit too successful as an editor, where within a year of its uh, in inception, it got uh, shut down by Prussian authorities. So Germany is under the Prussian uh, Empire, very, very powerful empire back then, in this time period. It, so it, it gets, you know, it gets blacklisted, it gets shut down, and he has to flee. Karl Marx has to flee Germany, and he goes to Paris. Uh, so he, he moves to Paris, and there he meets um, some very important uh, socialist thinkers. 
So he just very gets more and more enmeshed into these radical working class organizations, these mutual aid organizations that are popping up in protest of this uh, industrial capitalism, this unfettered, unregulated, exploitative capitalism. And you think today we're explo exploited. It was back then was was bad. So he met people um, like um, Joseph Pohum, French guy. He has a really uh, interesting essay called uh, "What Is Property?" and Prohom. I gotta use that uh, accent, Prohom. Um, he states that property is no no le nothing less than theft. That property should be held in communal. Um, who else did he meet? Oh, he met. Uh, <laughs> It's not his, I was gonna say his best friend, I mean, being sarcastic. His met, he met his best, his, his worst enemy, <clears throat> Mikhail Bakunin. This guy's a Russian, uh, also an exile in Paris. But this guy Bakunin, he's known for his um, radical anarchy. He's an anarchist. So no government, no no central government, no state, no nothing, just anarchy. And Karl Marx was like, that's never going to work, man. We want to change the world. We need, we're going to need a strong state to turn the things around, to turn the productions, the relations of productions, and the means of productions. We just can't let things be, basically. And they became bitter enemies. Although they were pushing for the same kind of changes, right? They want to improve the lot of the working class. But this is the problem with leftist politics, that you have some factions that they never really get along. And that's what really, like, you know, uh, leftist politicians will never really, you know, garner support. That's a sad thing. But anyways, that's the way it is. I guess it's a good thing because there's always critiques for a better, better. All right, so Marx goes to Paris. He again becomes a, a co-editor to this new journal, Deutsche uh, Französische Jahrbuchen, the German-French Annals. So just a German-French newspaper. It's all about radicalism. Um, but also, I mean, also gets closed down. Um, the Prussian Empire pr uh, pressures French authorities to put, you know, to put a stop on Marxists, on Marx. Um, so that gets shut down. But nonetheless, he still, Marx is able to receive some money from it. So he's able to live comfortably there for a little while. Uh, and finally, what year is it? This is a pretty important year. When he meets his partner in crime forever, since he, until he dies, uh, Friedrich Engels. And where, where, did he, where did he meet? In 1842. So when his newspaper in Cologne, uh, in Paris, uh, shuts down, he meets Eric, uh, Frederick Engels, and they become best friends from there. Cool thing about Frederick Engels, he's, he's a factory owner. <laughs> he's, he's one of the ones, he's like the one that Marx is trying to destroy. <laughs> so Engels is a factory owner. Uh, his family owns a lot of factory mills, not just in England and Manchester, but also in Germany, in Westphalia. So he comes from a very fucking rich family, like from the bourgeoisie. Right, so they're, co they're complete opposites, Marx and Engels. But Engels, for some reason, he also sees his vision that we need to change the way things are. He kind of he feels bad for his workers. As a matter of fact, Frederick Engels um, has a, a long life, uh, uh, not a long life, a long time relation with one of her own, one of his own workers, uh, Jenny Burns. She's an Irish, right. and this guy, right, he's, he's a factory owner, the manager of the factory, he's supposed to be the bourgeoisie, the elite class, not to mingle with these poor working class Irish people that are drunkards, and all you have to do is just work and stuff, but he ends up marrying her, so he has like this, this sweet spot, this, he just feels sympathy and empathy for the working class, because he's there all the time, that's where he works at, he sees the toil and uh, the suffering of the working class. And he's very, I mean, he's, he's very aware of that. And actually, he writes a book about the, what is it called? The conditions of the English working class. 
basically saying how fucked up working in a factory is, how it's dangerous, how it's low pay, how it's just bad. Right? So it's, it's, it's pretty radical for what he is, this Freddick angles. So this is like the, the big, perhaps the most important like uh, romance ever, seriously, angles and marks. Created an impressive amount of incredible work that still is changing the world today. And it was the group romance. I wonder if anybody has ever uh, studied whether they were homosexual partners or not. I wouldn't doubt if they were. But anyways, Freddie Engels pretty much supported, sponsored Marx uh, all the way until his death. Um, the average uh, that most scholars kind of give is that he gave, he would give about until his death from 1842 until 1883 for, for about 40 years. Engels pretty much kind of buried, paid for everything for Marx, would give him about 7000 a year. This was a third of Engels' own income. That's a sizable amount of money. Anyways, if it wasn't for that, he wouldn't have these fucking magnus opus, incredible pieces of philosophy that are still with us today. <clears throat> All right, so let's go on. So they produced a lot of uh, things together. The most famous one is, of course, the Communist Manifesto. That's... Uh, in your book there, I strongly recommend you read it. It's really short. It was meant to be clear as day for that workers themselves could understand it. So um, I'm sure you could understand it as well. Perhaps there's like some references to different like kind of like groups here and there you might not know, but just keep reading on and you'll understand exactly what he's talking about. Um, so yes, he was politically active. He was an activist. He was always in trouble, always in exile, always running away. He ended up in Brussels for a while, and finally he decided to, to stay in London, because London, London was a little bit more liberal. It was kind of known as a place for exiles. A lot of exiles, political exiles, would end up in London, because London already had a pretty strong tradition of being more open-minded, more or less. Right? <clears throat> so in 1848, Engels and, and Marx, um, published the Communist Manifesto. And yeah, I mean, he dies in 1881, pretty much in the gutter. There were only Angles and his own family was there for the funeral. In, eight, in the 1870s, uh, he creates the International, his international group of workers. It's pretty important. The reason why we have like Lenin now and stuff is that and communism. Pretty much, he was the he was like the father of communism. It's Marx. Um, yeah. When Engels died, because I kind of I kind of have to say this. When Engels died, he gave everything, the inheritance, to all to Marx's sons and, and daughters. All right, so that's how much Engels loved Marx. Even, that, even when he died, gave everything up to Marx's family, to his offspring. I'm telling you, the ultimate bromance, right? All right, let's go into his actual like philosophy. It's pretty, pretty important. A lot of uh, a lot of things are unfortunately you can still apply today. I would say. So. <clears throat> Marx totally buys into the Hegelian view of history, especially dialectic. But as he says, uh, Marx himself, is that he turned Hegel on his head. So Hegel was all about his idealism, right? his universal mind. Right? I myself wasn't even, I don't even know what the, how the fuck to define that properly. Uh, Hegel really just uses a lot of fucking things just to kind of talk about it, but doesn't really give you the exact but right, it's still kind of abstract, it's still very ideal. Right? There's no like grounding to it. Right? It's just out there in the air. It's just very, very theoretical. There's no concrete evidence to back it up. Marx, via Engels' study of the actual working conditions of the working class, he grounds himself, right? what he calls the material conditions, just reality. 
right? So for for Marx, he develops what we call the dialectical materialism, where we do use a dialectic process right, of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, and that is the way that history goes. But it's not in the ideal. There's no universal mind. All there is are material conditions, matter, stuff, right, tools, right, instruments, machines, roads, cars, right. Just, just material stuff. That's what reality is, right? So, Marx is a staunch materialist. This is metaphysics. It's just matter that matters. It's the material conditions of society that makes everything up, that makes history, this process of history, dialectical process of history. So, right, so also, right, he's accepting the state that history goes through stages, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, but these stages are are uh, conditioned, or are, not conditioned, I'm not sure you use that, it's going to be repetitive, are determined, there we go, that's a better word, are determined by the material conditions of society. How is society set up? How is society working? What are the relations of production? And what are the means of production? Let me show you, let me kind of, hopefully I could draw this nicely. I guess I'll just do that. So here we have what we call the base. And over here we have the superstructure. The base, these are the means of production. Right? The things that we use to produce, the means of production. So these are tools, these are instruments, these are factories, these are roads, but these are all these things we need to produce stuff. That's the basic kind of uh, idea for that. Let me see. So the tools, the machines, the raw material, the land, the factories, and the people, the workers. These are the means of production, the base. The superstructure, these are like the relations that these product, these, these uh, I guess, products do or give us. Are the relations that these products result in. So these are like ideas and ideologies. So we'll have like culture. We have culture over here. We have family, politics, the media, education, art, religion, philosophy, law, science, values, social norms. That's the superstructure. Right. So there's this distinction here. And what's going on here, according to, to, to Marx's theory here, is that the base shapes, gives form, right? It determines the superstructure. So the means of production determines the superstructure and the superstructure in return maintains, I just, I won't even write that because I won't be able to fix it, maintains the base. So it's like this feedback loop that's going on between the base and the superstructure. <clears throat> and for Marx, we need to change the base first, right? This is the way we, we need to change the base in order to, to reform, to give it a different shape to the superstructure, to the way we think, to the way we uh, relate to each other, to the way we relate to society, right? The relations of production. Those relations of productions, superstructure, means of productions, the base, right? This is really important concepts here, <clears throat> which I think none of this comes out of your textbook, which is super unfortunate, right? And for, for us, the, the, the job of the Marxists right, is to change the world, so we need to change the means of production. And how do we change it? So right now, according to Marx, in capitalism, under a capitalist system, the means of productions are owned by a certain few, the factory owners. 
and they manipulate, they use those means of production to their own profitability, to their own interests. And that in turn shapes the way we think about society itself as a whole, and thus maintains that system of capitalism going. So we think that uh, the harder we work, the, the more paycheck, or this, the boss is gonna notice us, and we're gonna get a raise. No, the boss could get another worker if he wants to. <laughs> right, simple as that, right? We are disposable like that. And this is the this is part of capitalism, argues Marx. So there's different ways of, of organizing society. Right? And according to Marx, it's all about the means of production. It's all about the economics. Marxism is an economic philosophy. Right? It's all about economics. Economics runs the world. Matter, material stuff is what runs the world. <clears throat> so there's different ways to uh, organize society. Of course, right now we're organizing a capitalist society. In such a system, this organization, wealth goes to anyone who can acquire it in the marketplace. That the right of these should be open to everybody in this marketplace. In a socialist society, in socialism, this is the political and economic doctrine that the means of production, right, property, factories, businesses, land, should be owned or controlled by the people, either communally or through the state. All right, so instead of a couple of few wealthy individuals owning the factories, the people that actually work in the factories own it. They share that ownership together. Why is that? Why does Marx think that should be the way? Oh, and the other third of system is communism. In communism, I really don't like the distinction that the textbook here says, but it, it is it is this. It is pretty much the same thing as socialism, where the means of production goes to the people that work those means, but it implies or necessitates the strong central pretty much like a totalitarian government in order to change those productions, those means of productions and the relations of productions, the base and the superstructure, right? Basically here in communism, um, Marx says that, you know, these factory owners are not gonna change on their own. <laughs> They're not gonna give up all that power and all those profits away. Thus, we're gonna need what he calls the dictatorship of the proletariat. Dictate, oh man, I'm even spell dictator. Dictatorship of the problem. proletariat. So you might be asking yourself, what the fuck is a proletariat? <laughs> so you know what a dictatorship is, right? It's, it's the totalitarian system, right? It's all being controlled by a dictator. But here the dictator is the proletariat. So who is the proletariat? Let's define that. The proletariat is just the working people. The people that work in the factories that don't own the means of production. All they own is their labor. So they have to sell that labor, like a prostitute basically, for an hourly wage or a weekly wage or a monthly wage. This is us. I hate to break it to y'all, but we're all prostitutes. We all are selling our labor. We don't own anything beyond that. This is the proletariat. The bourgeoisie, on the other hand, so the bad and bougie, the bourgeoisie, these are the owners of the means of production. These are the owners of the factories, of the land, the landowner. These right, people right now are freaking out about rent and stuff. Because we need to pay the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie is that. So uh, this is the thesis and antithesis that Hegel is talking about, a la Marx. So we have thesis. Right? This is the Hegelian system. Oh. Antithesis. And then synthesis. In Marx, we have the bourgeoisie, so I just put a B, 
the bourgeoisies or the owners or the factories, the rich, wealthy people that we work for, for a wage, that we sell our labor for a wage, our bodies, basically, our hands for a wage in our minds. And the antithesis, the opposite, right, the servants, think about the Hegelian master-servant relation here, the proletariat, the workers, and the synthesis is revolution, transformation of the entire base superstructure, where now we can have socialism, where now the workers own the factories because they work it. And why does he think this way? Why does Mark, Karl Marx say that the workers don't own, right? that all we own is our labor, that all we sell is our labor? basically our bodies. It is because of the idea of alienation, this idea that he has, the idea of alienation. Bring it up over here. Those class antagonisms. So what I just talked about, the bourgeoisie versus the proletarian, that's what we call class antagonism. There's two classes, the rich, wealthy class, and then the working class. And they're in opposites. They're in constant trouble. As a matter of fact, in the Communist Manifesto, they rightly complain, uh, they proclaim that all hierarchical history is a history of class struggle. Right? Slave versus master, Bolivian versus master, right? Serf versus uh, knight and stuff. It's always been like that, history. Right? Again, this Hegelian notion of history in these dialectical matter. So let's talk about alienation. What does alienation mean? Let me find it here because it's... Okay. So alienation, it takes a number of forms that it's all related to the way we produce something, to our productive activity. So it is in the nature of just people to be active and interactive with nature and other people. And in the process, we make things and we change things. And it's interaction between us, other people, and nature. Right? This is just a natural thing. It's just what happens. When these relationships become distorted or estranged, according to Marxists, we are not fulfilling our nature, what he calls a, a species, uh, species nature nature species, something like that. I can't believe I forgot that concept. Anyways, there's different kinds of alienations. So what happens here when we become alienated is that we no longer are in touch with our natural inclinations. So first of all, capitalism alienates us from the products of our own labor, from the things that we make, because they are not ours. So take, for example, a shaker now in a factory. That shoe he's making in the assembly line, that's not his. It's the owners who's going to make a profit on that shoe, on the product. Think about a Nike company, right? Those poor Chinese kids <laughs> that are making Nikes for us. Right? They don't own those. We own it. Right? We bought it, right? Off Amazon, right? Or Nike.com, right? We bought it and we own it, right? And the money went not to the Chinese kid directly who made it, but to the owner of Nike, right? Or an Apple computer, right? The people making those apples out there in uh, Foxconn companies, the factories, they call it Foxconn, um, they don't own those computers. Although they're making them with their hands, with their body making these computers for us. We own those computers. And who gets the money is, well, not Steve Jobs tomorrow, who the fuck is the CEO, but he gets the money, right? And it's dispersed by the Apple workers. This is the idea that Marx has in his head that's going on here, right? It's not quite the same no more, but you get what the drift is going here, right? For example, I worked at Starbucks for five years. Every single cup of coffee was not mine. It was, it had a name for somebody else, as a matter of fact, right? This is the first kind of alienation we have, that everything we make now is not ours. So we feel estranged from our own nature of speech, of us, like a species that we're supposed to do. This is our nature to make things and build things with our hands. 
And now we don't have that. We've just, we're alienated from that. So we use that word alien, or it's alien to us. Just don't know, we don't own our, product, our productive activity no more. And that's essentially human activity. So we're not human no more. We're like subhuman. We're just machines. We're just cogs in the machine. We're losing our humanity because of capitalism, says Marx. Um, another form of alienation is that we are alienated from the work that we do is mainly for someone else. So again, right, all the work we do is not really for us, but it's for someone else. And then we are alienated from each other because we have competition, you know. If I start slacking in the job, I get fired and the next person next to me is gonna get that job. Right? Because you know, we are alienated from each other because the productive process of capitalism requires a superstructure of ideas which distorts and obscures the naturally comparative way that we should relate to the other people. For example, capitalism pits worker against worker by installing the idea that they are in, comp in competition same work for the same job. And then finally, we are also alienated from ourselves as a species. This is the most fundamental kind of alienation because of all these process of alienations, we now we're not human no more. We're just cogs in the machine. We're just robots doing what we're told. All right, so right, other things that we do, right? Anybody you know in the service industry, whatever, all, all the food that you make, if you're a chef or, or if you're a bartender, all the drinks you make, it's not really for you, it's for somebody else. And then that work itself, you know, you, tender, you know, you don't own the bar, and, and if you do, congrats, you're part of the bourgeoisie. You have to worry about this stuff. <clears throat> right, so pretty much if you own some kind of means production, then you're gonna get profits. You're gonna be living a comfortable life. But if you don't own, all you're gonna own is just your labor. And that's gonna be exploded more and more and more. Because the owners of the factories are gonna want more profits. And the most easiest way to make profits is to lower down people's. And that's what happens as we create more machines. We need workers, the machine can do it, right? It's much easier. So now everybody just has to press a button. There's no skilled jobs anymore, right? And if there are skilled jobs, those are the jobs you won't get. That's why you're here in university. That's why you're studying this stuff, right? To not be just pressing buttons or doing the same thing that anybody else could do. This is alienation. <clears throat> so we are no longer valued as persons. We have become mere cogs in the capitalist machinery. We can't take longer any pride in our work because it's not, first of all, it's not ours. And then it's just mindless assembly line motions. There's nothing creative about that. It's gonna feed our human species. <clears throat> um, another important um, concept that Marx uh, develops, just not in your textbook, at all. It's really fucking sad it's not there. Uh, this is the idea of the fetish, the fetish concept. The fetish concept. What is that? So this is a, a Kantian example, a concept actually. Uh, Kant really came up with this idea of the fetish. So Kant distinguished real religious concern with the true nature of God, of man, and their relationship between them from unreal or distorted religious thought. So this latter, this, 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 this distorted religious thought is what Kant called fetishism, which is a way that humans project themselves subjectively onto the world of man-made objects. 
So basically, let me kind of translate this here. We we have a fetish of a man-made object that gives an right. We could call it. You may want to say that I have a book fetish. Right? I love books. And there's more books over there. You see it. There are books over here. There's a lot of books everywhere here. All right, you might say, and that's kind of how I make my identity. Right, I'm a scholar, professor, and I read books. I write books. All right, so this is right. This is what he's calling the same, that we attach ourselves to some man-made object to make us, to make our subject, right, to make my subjective exist real, I guess, by clinging on to some objects, by clinging on to some MJs, right, some Nike, Jordans, right, or clinging on to uh, some Dior uh, fashionable things, right? These man-made objects is what's given us identities. It was giving us existence now. This is the fetish concept that Marx talks about. <clears throat> so humans attach the same fetishist, fetishistic magic to commodities as they are part of this, as they're bigger than us. Right? As if, like, you know, coach, a right? brand coach, or Hilfiger, I don't know what else, what is out there, Adidas, it's bigger than us. So we can use that object to make my subject something. Right? This is the fetish concept. And this kind of also kind of alludes to the idea of this estrangement, this alienation. Um, this idea, this, it's not in the textbook, but I have some uh, readings that are uploaded. The economic manuscripts of 1844. It's all about this, the alienation stuff. So if you like this talk here that I'm talking about, go read that stuff. It's really good stuff. People still refer to it today. So basically, we are unhappy in our present state of consciousness because it has been reduced to a commodity relationship that values things and not people. Right? So this is the fetish concept. And now we value things over people. We care more about, I care more about my car, right, than people being detained by ICE and getting sick by uh, coronavirus and not being done nothing about it, just letting them die. Because it's actually less expensive, funerals are less expensive than detainment. So these migrants, these poor migrants that wanted a better life out here in the U.S. are being detained by ICE here downtown, right down the street here. And there's an outbreak of coronavirus and sooner or later they're gonna die because not getting in the world not getting well medication, so well uh, access to uh, healthcare. And, you know, people say that's on purpose. It's much, much cheaper to bury them than to keep them detained. And that's happening right now. Right? We care more about objects than we care about people. This is an effect of capitalism. So the, this economic system, this capitalist system, says Marx, has forced us to treat each other as other means. It's just means to get me more money or to get me a better place in this life. So we are alienated from ourselves. So this is what Karl Marx says in one of his, uh, one of his uh, articles that's called On the Jewish Question. So the Jewish are the ones that have all the money, right, supposedly. So Marx says, money is the universal self-constituted value of all things. Hence, it has robbed the whole world, the human world, as well as nature, of its proper value. Money is the alienated essence of man's labor in life. And this alien essence dominates him as he worships it. All right. So how can we get rid of this? <laughs> and this sounds fucking terrible, right? Read the Communist Manifesto. There's 10 points there that he says how to change the world here. And a lot of these points are have proven right. We've got these. And I'm just going to read them out loud really quickly and then call it a day. First point, these measures we need to take. And of course, it'd be different in different countries. But these are the basic kind of principles of socialism, Marxist, communism. One. Abolition of, of property and land and application of our rents of land to public purposes. 
So the abolition of private property, number one. Two, a heavy progressive or graduated income tax. The more money you make, the more you share it to everybody else. Right? Care about other people. Don't care about commodities. You're losing your human essence. Right? Number three, abolition of all rights of inheritance. Right? You need to make it a fair, uh, it's being fair. Right? It's unfair that if your great, great, great grandparents made money, and possibly they made money off of slaves, is it just unfair that you're making it, that you have that advantage now? Right? So to make it fair play, to open up the marketplace, in a sense, no inheritance. Everybody, when they're born, begins at number zero. Number four, confiscation of the property of all immigrants and rebels. So if you leave the, the society, the community, or you rebel against this society, we confiscate your property and give it back to the community. Number five, centralization or credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly. So all credit is controlled by the state. And here the state is the people, the proletarians, the workers. They create this organization, the commune, the community, so it's called communism, to control this stuff here. But instead of owing to Capital One or to Discover Cards or to whatever MasterCard, you owe your other your fellow workers if they give you credit. There's no interest charges, just like that, right? It's just, we're all in this together. Uh, number six, centralization of the means of communication and transport in the hands of the state. Here, the state, again, is the proletarians, the working class, the dictatorship of the proletariat. Number seven, extension of factories and instruments of production owned by the state, the bringing into cultivation of wastelands, and the improvement of the soil generally generally in accordance with the coming plan. Right, so factories, the means of production, the land, all that should go turn to the state, to the workers, and they're gonna plan how to best work that, cultivate that stuff. Number eight, equal liability of all labor. Right, so everybody should work more or less give the same kind of amount of labor, right? There's gonna be no freebies. It's all about labor and communism, it's about work, right? Um, one of his main, um, one of his main, uh, Marx's main dictum, main principle is that to each according to their ability, to each according to their need. And first comes ability. You give what you're able to give and then you get what you need. That's communism to each according to their ability, then to each according to their need. You give and you receive. That's basic Marxist communism. Equal liability of all labor, that's number eight. Establishment of industrial armies, especially for agricultural. So just, you know, uh, give more jobs to the workers, especially farmers. Number nine, combination of agriculture with manufacturing industries gradual abolition of the distinction between town and country by a more equitable distribution of the population over the country. Right, so according to Marx, there's like this, this relation that's unfair or unequal between town and country. Right, so the town is the manufacturing cities and the country that produces the raw material. And it's like this parasitical relationship that should be equal, should be harmonized. Number 10, and the final point, free education for all children in public schools. Abolition of children, factory labor in its present form, so no child labor, and the combination of education with industrial production, etc. It doesn't sound too bad, you know? I mean, I guess if you are a bourgeoisie and you have a lot of land, you own that land, this sounds fucking terrible. <laughs> but if you're a working class, you have nothing but your labor to sell, this sounds like a utopia, right? And it is a utopia. This is never gonna fucking happen, unfortunately. But I wish there would be this, you know, we would live in harmony where everybody would give to each other and care for each other. But unfortunately, people care more about their computers and laptops and cars than they care about their neighbors. What can we do about that, right? But at least we're aware of this way of thinking 
and this is Hegel Marx. Next time, next chapter. We'll Dr. Mark Elman, MD, is on 1400 Common Drive Whoa. in El Paso and is 10.1 miles away. Thank you. It's going to share to me, fucking Siri. All right. Talk about Marx, right? Talk about, talk about alienation. I'm talking to a fucking robot here now. So, next chapter, chapter 11, existential, chapter 14, existentialism. And existentialism is a whole lot more positive than communism. But basically, it's all about the individual. You know, shit is bad. How can we make best? Shit is absurd. How can we make sense of this? That's an existentialism. And we'll do that next time. Um, and yeah, there will be a discussion board for this. Marxist, just because I'm really uh, interested in this stuff. And I want you, I want to know what you guys think about this Marxist stuff. All right, you guys be safe. And we'll see you next time.